I'm pretty sure there are a few fans in here of the property of Marvel. Yeah, is that true? Make some noise if you love Marvel. Oh, man. Make some noise if you love things like WandaVision. Yeah, yeah. I mean, give, give, it, was, it was a great series, y'all. What about uh, my, one of my personal favorites, Black Panther? Yeah, yeah right? So, coming to the stage, y'all, is someone who is very, very intimately known with these properties. Coming to the stage very soon is John Lepore. Uh, a little bit about John. After working at the same job for 16 years, and not just the same job, it was his dream job, he quit to start consulting for, uh, for many different businesses. Only one month ago. So I want everyone in this room to give their thoughts and prayers to John in this very hard time in his transition. Uh, his passion is to share his expertise and inspire clients to, uh, and organizations to embrace emerging tech and forward-thinking design. As he would say himself, he is a self-proclaimed futurist, though he also hates the word Futurist. If that, sound, if that doesn't sound like a tech hipster, I don't know what else does. He is also Emmy nominated for his work on WandaVision. And in this presentation, you can expect him to go through an entire talk that is so much fun. From diving into exciting tech, fast cars, designing and designing tech for the movie Black Panther. Y'all, I know y'all are tired of seeing me and can't wait to see this man, so please give it up for John Lepore! Let's do it. Oh, I can't wait. All right, how's everybody doing? Uh, uh, really fun to be here today to talk with you all about some of the things that are really close to my heart, uh, I've been really fortunate to carve out this really weirdly, bizarrely specific niche for myself that's right at the cross-section of science fiction and science fact. And for me, you know, this is, this is something that uh, it covers a little bit of my expertise as a creative leader, as a futurist, as a technologist, but more than anything, it's all about my mindset when it comes to design. And for me, my relationship with design started back with this thing. Uh, when I was a kid, I had a poster of one of these on my bedroom wall. I'm sure somebody else in here had the same poster. And this thing, to me, it was so like impossibly futuristic and beautiful and exciting and dramatic and cool. But it frustrated me so much. I would say to my dad, like, Dad, why, why does not every single car look like the Lamborghini Countach? This is clearly the perfect design for any automobile. Why isn't our Toyota shaped like this? And he explained to me that, well, it, it doesn't look this way just to be a beautiful and exciting object. It's actually a product of all of these engineering decisions that are made. The car is pointy at the front so that it can carve through the air and reach a, a faster top speed. It's wide at the back so that it can house this enormous V12 engine. And he explained to me, you know, you appreciate it because it's something that looks cool. I have this even more enhanced, exhausted, like, uh, God-level appreciation for this thing because it is, it is this perfect balance of the design and the aesthetic integrating into its function, its purpose, the way that it was engineered. And this, for me, basically triggered the way that I would think about design for the rest of my life. So there's always this sort of balance or this friction between the aesthetics or the function of something, the, the design and the engineering, uh, the form and function. You could even think of it as like right brain versus left brain. Now, I've been really fortunate in the last 10 years to focus on my own version of this balance that is centered around this idea of science fiction and science fact. So 
What do I mean when I'm talking about science fiction and science fact? In science fiction, I've had the opportunity to design fictional gadgets and technologies that appear in blockbuster films. In science fact, I've also been able to contribute to all different kinds of exciting technology products for the real world that aren't fictional objects. So when I'm working in film, for me, it's always an opportunity to look at how ambitious, how like we can use this sort of fictional landscape as almost like a R&D laboratory for what technology can become for us in the future. I, I love working in this space. I geek out super hard over this stuff, take it way too seriously when we're designing these uh, fictional technologies that appear in these blockbuster films. Now, I spend the other 50% of my time working on real-world technology products. And it's a really exciting time right now in tech because there's so many interesting emerging technologies. We've got things like uh, AR and VR and artificial intelligence and all these different elements that are becoming more and more important uh, as, as the technology landscape moves forward. So for me, I, I love balancing these two worlds and, and really celebrating the, the friction and the relationship between them. There's always been a little bit of this precedent for the idea that uh, science fiction can inform science fact, like Jules Verne uh, inspired some of the creators of, of uh, the, the submarine. Uh, Motorola engineers were referencing the Star Trek communicator when they designed the first flip phone. But for me, it's not just a sort of one-way street. I love finding ways to take some of the experiences that I've had in real-world tech and apply that back into fiction. And it's not just sort of like inspiration, but it's even the sort of mindset that you get that can be very different in these two worlds and finding ways to cross-pollinate between them, to approach working on a fictional film with thoughts around information architecture or, or even just some of the processes that come with human-centered design for, for real-world products. When we take that approach, I find that it's an opportunity to make the technology that we see in fiction feel a little more plausible, a little more engaging, and a little less like it's just another movie that has glowing blue shit everywhere to let you know that it's the future. So, in real-world tech, I'm finding myself pulled into these spaces where there's a lot of really exciting problems that are still yet to be solved. There's things like augmented reality, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles. Uh, all of these spaces are spaces where like, the, the best practices haven't yet been defined, right? There isn't already a template for how to be successful uh, when it comes to designing these advanced products. And I love working in these spaces as well as all these other bizarre niche spaces that I've found my way into, like military-grade cybersecurity or, or working in aerospace. Uh, one niche that has been really close to my heart has been working in automotive. And recently, uh, my, my team and I put together the entire operating system for the new Hummer EV that is coming out this year. Working on a vehicle like this was really exciting. I mean, I think you can already imagine, like, there is a very cinematic sort of personality to a vehicle like this, right? And it was really fun to work with and, and develop some advanced concepts for it, but it was also for us a really important responsibility to capture all the right parts of the personality of this vehicle. The Hummer has a heritage that is actually traced back to it being a military vehicle, which when I'm thinking about the possibilities of the future, to me that almost felt a little bit dystopian. And I was really fortunate that the team at General Motors were really on board with us pushing something that would be a little more optimistic of a touch point in the vehicle's heritage. General Motors actually contributed to the design of the very first Lunar Rover, and that was something that inspired my team and I tremendously as we were putting together this digital experience within the vehicle. Working on something like this is a pretty huge responsibility. Uh, the worst case scenario for your end user in an automobile, the worst case scenario can be very bad, so you need to make sure that you're putting an enormous emphasis 
on legibility, clarity of information, and, and making sure that the system never creates any opportunity for confusion. Some of the human factors that we played off of were, were really interesting opportunities like this was the first vehicle to have a, uh, a day mode in its instrument cluster, which isn't an aesthetic choice. It's actually something that ensures that when you're driving around in bright daylight, you'll have a, a bright enough background on the instrumentation that it'll cut through any possible glare that could appear on the screen, making it hard to see. But also, we use a, a, a decision like that as a motivator to also find ways to incorporate a little like cinematic touch. When the uh, lighting conditions change over the course of the day when you're driving in the vehicle, and you transition from night mode to day mode or vice versa, rather than it just being this sort of uh, cut transition, we had this beautiful sort of like sunrise, sunset motif that I think imbues the final product with a tremendous sense of quality. There was tons of various visualizations and, and different sort of instrumentation that we had to put together for this. One of my favorites was this pitch and roll gyro. And again, because we were bringing uh, not a traditional user experience mindset, but also like a 3D animation mindset to this. We were able to put something like this together, which conveys the experience a lot more clearly to the, the driver of this vehicle. But it also, for us, it spurred General Motors into looking into basically figuring out how do we develop something that could have an instrument like this that has this great level of like detail and dimensionality. And the only way that was possible was to start leveraging for the first time in a vehicle a gaming engine. And we actually used Unreal Engine to put this together in uh, the, the General Motors Hummer EV. So you know, working on a vehicle like this, it's an enormous um, amount of fun. There's all of these different challenges that come up. But at the same time, it's always so critical for my team and I that we're focusing on that clarity, making sure that all of these instruments read uh, very directly for the driver to minimize any chances of distraction or confusion. We look at opportunities to use interesting uh, animated visualizations to also encourage drivers to take better advantage of the capabilities of this absolutely insane vehicle, while at the same time you know, capturing the essence of its really unique and distinct personality. So I want to switch over from some of my work in science fact to some of the work that I've done in fiction. And without question, my absolute favorite project that I have ever worked on was contributing to Marvel Studios' Black Panther. Uh, having a sense of the kind of work that I'm doing, uh, you will immediately understand that the best brief that I could possibly receive was the one that we got from Marvel when they said, OK, the movie is called Black Panther. It takes place in this fictional world of Wakanda. Wakanda must have the most advanced technology that we have ever seen on film before. And not only that, but the world of Wakanda has been isolated from the rest of the world and kept to themselves. And so the tech in Wakanda cannot be driven by or just a, a natural extension of traditional Western technology. So with a brief like that, my team and I immediately started doing research. And we prepared a, a presentation for the filmmakers at, at Marvel, uh, just focused on what were some interesting technological innovations and, and scientific phenomena that we could reference. Uh, beyond that brief of make it the coolest tech that it could possibly be or the most advanced tech that it could be, the only other nugget that we had was that the Society of Wakanda centers around this element called vibranium. And we said, well, what is vibranium? They said, we're not sure. You guys figure it out. So we, we just started extrapolating and saying to ourselves, all right, well, vibranium, uh, vibration, sound, haptics. And we started looking at really interesting things like the phenomena of cymatics, where specific sound frequencies can create geometric shapes and forms. And I think we, we looked at this immediately. We we're like, oh my god, that's, like, that's perfect. It looks uh, scientific. It looks geometric. It looks natural. It almost looks tribal in a, in a certain way. 
Another really interesting space that we were drawn to is something that was loosely connected to some previous work we had done in the automotive space. This is a array of ultrasonic transducers, uh, basically a, a bunch of little tiny mini speakers that send out ultrasonic sound waves. You don't hear anything, but if you hold your hand above this panel, you will feel a, a little bit of like a haptic sensation. This was something that we were leveraging for automotive applications for uh, this, this concept known as like mid-air haptics, where you would reach out in the air and actually feel something that is not there. There's sound waves that are creating this vague sense of touch. Really interesting applications for you know, AR and VR and was something that was really interesting to us in the automotive space where we, we've lost this sense of having tactile controls and knobs and switches when we have uh, flat touch screens that we interact with. So while we were working with this, we discovered that the University of Tokyo was using these same ultrasonic transducer arrays to actually levitate styrofoam particles in air. Really, really cool shit. Uh, seeing these little beads be able to hover in space and translate their position around, uh, to us, really exciting, really interesting. And so we took this principle and this concept and we extrapolated it forward and started saying to ourselves, well, if you were using that same kind of technology with the ultrasonic sound waves, and instead of styrofoam particles, you had vibranium, then we could have a really exciting and really interesting technological paradigm. So we went to the director, Ryan Kugler, in our very first presentation, we went through all these different phenomena and references, and we said, we think there's this opportunity that rather than Black Panther being a film that's filled with uh, holograms made of glowing light floating in the air, it could be this very physical uh, concept of vibranium sand that would levitate in the space, create three-dimensional sculptures, and ultimately appear in the film uh, something like this. So this is one of the first scenes in the film where we see the vibranium sand. It's creating a sort of like tactical map of Black Panther's enemies down on the ground below him. And he's able to see this very physical representation of the, the landscape around him. To get it to this point, we did all different kinds of tests and experiments and tinkering. Uh, we built our own sand table in our office just so that we could like physically feel sand with our hands and have that inform the sort of decisions that we were making around how to interact with it, how to work with it. Uh, we even went as far as playing around with like embedding digital displays into our sand table so that we could see what would happen when light would sort of shine through the, the translucent qualities of sand crystals. Um, so all of this work ended up appearing in the film Black Panther in a wide array of, of different ways. So throughout the film, we get to see this, uh, this vibranium sand motif used for all these different purposes. You can see right now playing a, a montage of a lot of the different R&D and tests and experiments that we had put together, looking at ways that, you know, rather than interacting with it with like touchscreen gestures, at times you can just brush it away with your, with your hand. Uh, we used it to create communications devices to have this sort of like volumetric Skype control uh, with, with the characters within the film. Uh, there was all these different fun applications. Uh, it even was incorporated into this awesome car chase scene that unfolds in the middle of the, of the film where a, a car is being remotely controlled from across the globe. Uh, we, we incorporated these, these ideas, these paradigms into the film in so many different ways. One of my favorites was even the way that Black Panther's suit sort of activates and builds on around him as he's jumping into battle, into, into action. And, you know, for us, these opportunities were, were so exciting, and they kept multiplying. The director of the film, Ryan Coogler, came to us and said, hey, we want to open the film with a history of Wakanda sequence, and it should all be rendered as if it was vibranium sand telling us that story. We even closed out the film with a closing title sequence that plays almost like a, a music video celebrating the conclusion of the film. Uh, this was so much fun. One of the most exciting aspects of this 
was that they had an original song made for the title sequence by Kendrick Lamar, which that, that alone just kind of like blew my mind. But we were able to take Kendrick's song and pipe it into our uh, particle simulation systems so that the music would actually control the movement and the vibration of the sand. So uh, without question, Black Panther, uh, uh, for me, absolute favorite project to have had an opportunity to contribute to. So I hope this gives you a, a broad sense of how I'm playing with the balance between these two worlds and how, you know, for me, the most important thing to take away from this is that when we are looking towards the future, we need to remain as optimistic as we possibly can be. Uh, you know, we don't need to generate more dystopian futures in, in fiction. We, we, can, we can make them as positive as we want them to be and as inspiring as we want them to be, but we can also approach them from different perspectives. I, I always want every team to figure out ways to, to cross their disciplines and bring people who, you know, maybe are more focused on uh, visual effects or animation and bring them into the world of human-centered product design and bring people who are from that space into these more ambitious and open-ended areas. So I appreciate you all coming out to, uh, to listen to this. And uh, if anybody wants to geek out about any of this stuff at any point, I'm always down to, uh, to, to get into it. Everybody enjoy the rest of your time here today. Thank you.